Good morning and welcome. I would like to welcome all the participants and panelists in this webinar today, chemical safety in the context of the European Union, transfer of knowledge and uh, overview of the good practices. I am Borislav Malinovic, and uh, together with my colleague uh, Melina jajic valjevac I'll moderate today's webinar. I uh, work as the Associated Professor at the Faculty of Technology in Banja Luka. Before we start with the webinar today, I'd like to draw your attention to some technical details. Since we'll be using the Zoom application today in the webinar mode, which is uh, somewhat different and offers more options than the usual meeting mode. This first of all means that you will not be able to turn on your cameras, but you have this option uh, Q&A, questions and answers that you can use to communicate with the panelists of the day. And you will be able to ask them questions. You can uh, ask the questions immediately during the presentation or after the presentation. And after all the presentation, we have set aside some time for panel discussion that we'll try to use to answer most of your questions. There is also the chat option to communicate, but we will still ask you to uh, write your questions to the panelists uh, in the Q&A, not the chat option. The part of the webinar will be in English, so I would like to share with you that we have the option for simultaneous translation. You can select in the menu. If you are using the mobile application, you have interpretation, this symbol of a, a small globe where you can select the language that you'd like to listen and I can only guess that you will be selecting BHS when the uh, panelists uh, speak in English and the opposite uh, works for the panelists. If you have any technical problems, for example, cannot have the uh, good quality of the sound, this webinar is also broadcast uh, on the YouTube, so you can uh, go there too, but you will not be able to ask questions. Uh, I have a great pleasure in seeing that we have uh, 116 participants already, and I hope more will join us later on. Now I will say a few sentences about the project ESAP 2030 under which this uh, webinar is organized. This is an assistance by the Embassy of the Kingdom of Sweden in developing the strategy and action plan for environment for the whole country with the strategies and action plans for all administrative levels, the entities, uh, the Federation and Republika Srpska and the Brčko district as well as the state. Development of this uh, ESAP was entrusted to the uh, Swedish Environmental Institute. And uh, Bosnia Herzegovina is expected to receive the key instrument for protection of environment and the improvement of health and welfare of present and future generations of Bosnia Herzegovina. This project was officially started in September 2019, and the plan is to finish it in April 2022. The content of the ESAP will include the following seven areas uh, policy, environmental policy like water, waste, biodiversity, environment protection, air quality, climate change and energy, resource management and environmental management, and chemical safety and noise. The working group were established at all levels of authority and they uh, involve uh, many participants uh, respecting participatory processes 
and uh, uh, all of them want to contribute to this ASAP. In the project ASAP 2030 plus, together with my colleague Melina jajic valjevac I participate as a co-leader of the working group for chemical safety and noise. And I'm using this opportunity to invite my dear colleague Melina to address you, to share with you an overview of situation in Bosnia Herzegovina in the area of chemical safety. Melina. Thank you, Borislav. I also want to welcome all the participants. My name is Melina Jajic Valjevac, and I am a have a master's degree in chemistry and many years of experience uh, working in environmental project. I will try to briefly present in one presentation everything that we have done in our working group. Uh, actually four working groups uh, for four administrative levels in the country. And I can say that uh, the activities were mostly focused on identification of all the gaps and problems that we have in the field of chemical safety. And uh, also, when we recognize uh, certain issues, we need to engage in strategic planning in order to achieve what we want to see in 10 year time as a solution to our problems. Now I will share my screen. Just a moment, please. So, uh, this thematic group covers chemical safety. And uh, under this heading, we look at the use of chemicals and uh, uh, safety of humans and environment. What our strategic plan and the action plan wants to achieve are uh, the is the implementation of European directives as well as the conventions listed in this slide. I didn't want to burden you with the numbers and the decrees and the, and the numbers of the directives, but I just listed the areas regulated by this uh, European legislation. We have a uh, uh, regulations, we have uh, labeling and uh, uh, packaging, some uh, provisions regarding uh, different types of chemicals like mercury or detergents or the ozone uh, depleting uh, substances and pops, uh, asbestos as a part of uh, structures, buildings that can become very hazardous waste. Then we have plant protection products, uh, pesticides, etc. In addition, Bosnia-Herzegovina, apart uh, from being under obligation to align their legislation with the European legislation, they also need to align uh, the legislation with the uh, convention it had signed, uh, the Stockholm uh, Rotterdam and Vienna conventions, and we need to ratify the Minamata convention. In this slide, you can see what we have right now in Bosnia-Herzegovina in terms of the institutional and legal frameworks. Institutions of Bosnia-Herzegovina, when it comes to chemical safety are mostly responsible for reporting to the EU institutions, the secretariats, the conventions, and for the customs policies, including the controls and prevention of entry of the prohibited substances into Bosnia-Herzegovina. 
we can say this is quite well organized in the area of ozone depleting substances and uh, plant protection products. But uh, when we go to the entities and their competencies, entities and Bartko district of Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have the ministries that are competent for health, environment, labor and inspections. The legal framework, we can say that there is a significant difference between the legal framework that covers this area in Republika Srpska and the one in the Federation and the Brško district. Since in Republika Srpska, we have a, an exceptional situation since we have the law on chemicals and biocides and we've had it for a number of years already. And we have the secondary legislation developed, which uh, is already in, in enforced. In the Federation, we have the law on chemicals that was passed in November last year. And um, there are 24 months allowed to pass the secondary legislation that will allow for much better transposition of directives and implementation of all the requirements of the law. In terms of Brčko district, uh, no progress has been made. We've had uh, legislation 30 years old, which uh, were inherited from the old uh, Yugoslavia that mostly talk about poisons. In the past, the working groups had two series of meetings and we discussed uh, the challenges and problems Bosnia-Herzegovina is facing. I must say that the members of the working groups comprised uh, representatives of institutions, representatives of NGO sector, representatives uh, of business sector. and. Uh, research and educational centers. So in uh, a discussion and uh, through a participatory approach, we discussed uh, the priorities of the strategy and the action plan. So we have identified these challenges as listed in this slide. First of all, we have lack of harmonization of legislation at the level of Bosnia-Herzegovina, which uh, leads to uneven trade with chemicals. This necessitates uh, improvements in the legislation because the business sector suffers a lot of adverse uh, consequences uh, of, facing, of being faced with different rules in force in uh, the Republika Srpska as opposed to the Federation and Vrčko district. We don't have the chemical registration in the Federation, but now we have the legal basis. We have the law uh, that uh, means that this will be established. What is very interesting and what all the members of the working groups at all levels mentioned is that we have outdated chemicals, deserted industrial contaminated areas, uh, buildings with asbestos that requires in, uh, some uh, to be inventorized and rehabilitated. We have this legacy of uh, harmful chemicals. Then we have insufficient com competencies and capacities of institutions, technical capacities of institutions, and um, lack of awareness among the users of chemicals and general public, and uh, the lack of a statistical set of data to follow the implementation of the conventions. So once we recognize the challenges, it was uh, easy to see what could be the objectives of our work. Uh, first, improve the legislation in the area of chemical safety, establish a system of chemical registration, which can now be done, which now uh, applies to the Federation and Bartko district, establish inventory of the outdated chemicals, uh, deserted contaminated industrial areas and buildings containing asbestos, improved competencies and capacities of institutions. Also, the same goes to the, for the technical capacities of institutions, improved awareness of the users of chemicals and public 
and establish a set of statistical data to follow the implementation of the conventions. What uh, we have before us is the third meeting of the working group. And one of the purposes of this webinar is to empower the working group with the examples of uh, good practice from the European Union so that we can continue working on our strategy and action plan. We could be better equipped to continue this process. Those who are not the members of the working group, I'd like to use this uh, opportunity to invite them to visit the page of the ESAP project. There is one section about the e-consultations where they can leave their contact data and uh, take part in the process of developing this strategy. They will be able to offer uh, some comments, uh, proposals, etc., and thus take uh, a direct uh, participation in the development of the strategy and action plan. I invite you to really do so because this is the first time that Bosnia Herzegovina is developing uh, a document of this importance at all administrative levels. And for the first time, the chemical safety is covered in a document of this uh, importance. So please do take uh, part in this. That would be all from me for the time being. And one other thing I wanted to add, during the day today, the idea is that after each presentation, we ask you some questions to make the webinar a bit more interesting. And uh, you will be asked two questions after each presentation, just to, these are all questions from your respective areas. Sometimes they are not uh, directly linked to the presentation. Since we have 138 participants at this point, we would like to use the opportunity to get some feedback from you. So I uh, believe you will see the first uh, set of questions now. These are easy questions. And please uh, mark your answers. Thank you, Melina. Melina has had this awkward meet task to try to summarize the current situation in the area of chemical safety for us. Now you have two questions on your screen and we would appreciate uh, seeing your answers. We know that we have some participants who uh, will find these questions too easy, but please bear in mind that we have some participants who may not fully understand the concept of chemical safety. And while you are uh, completing this poll, we'll see the results. Since we don't want to uh, spend too much time on this, I'd like to say the following. We have some presenters from the Swedish Agency for Chemical. These are uh, Messrs. Mats Folkman and Torbjörn Lids. And, and we have uh, people from Alchem, the Association for Chemical Safety from Serbia. We will wait for the uh, poll to finish and we'll move on to the first presentation, the control of chemicals in the market by Mr. Portman. We'll just wait uh, uh, for the poll to finish. So we have the results. We can briefly look at them. But maybe it would be better to see all the answers at the end of the webinar. Let's uh, show the uh, biography of Mr. Forkman. Mr. Mats Sporkman is the senior advisor for the Swedish Chemicals Agency 
and his experience uh, includes risk assessment, risk management, enforcement, and impact assessment. He's had 16 years of experience in the chemical industry as a consultant, and he's also a project manager for the in Improvement Chemical Project in Albania. Mr. Portman, the floor is yours. Uh, so thank you very much uh, and uh, good morning to everyone. I'm very happy to be here uh, and to speak on this very important topic. So I will speak on uh, preventing harm, so controlling chemicals when they are placed on the market. Could I have next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, so uh, to start with, I mean, we need chemicals. They are a very important part of uh, modern life and we couldn't do without them. Um, but we also need to control chemicals or they will cause harm. So I have some examples from the sustainable development goals. Uh, for example, for the good health and well-being, we need to reduce the number of deaths and illnesses from hazardous chemicals because there are too many or any death is too many. But we also need uh, safe medicines and vaccines for good health and well-being. And to do these uh, medicines and vaccines, we need chemicals to produce them and to research them. And we need to have a sound management of chemicals and waste throughout the life cycle. But for to have affordable and clean energy, we also need uh, resource efficient and sustainable materials, which are chemicals. We need chemicals to do these materials and we need to use chemicals. So next slide, please. Uh, so just to remind ourselves, we are surrounded by chemicals. There are chemicals everywhere, not only uh, in, you know, in a chemical lab. Uh, and we are exposed to these chemicals. Uh, and the, being exposed to a chemical uh, means that we have a potential risk of harm. Uh, and we therefore have to think about what we need to address. Where do we find these chemicals? What is the problem or could be the problem? Well, the world, workplace is perhaps the most obvious, uh, especially a workplace where you use uh, chemicals. But also in household chemicals, so like cosmetics, uh, detergents, maybe you use uh, anti-mosquito um, pesticides at home. And not only the chemicals, but also in articles like uh, electronics, toys, clothes, and building materials, uh, they also include chemicals and they release chemicals, uh, more or less, but they are an important part of uh, the exposure. And this uh, exposure of chemicals, I mean, th that means it's a potential harm or hazard for us. Uh, it could be acute toxic, uh, I mean, like poison, uh, immediate poison, something that happens immediately, uh, or it could be corrosive, like uh, to the eye or the skin, uh, irritant or, or even worse, uh, corrosive. It can also be long-term effects like cancer, uh, it could be reprotoxic, uh, which means that it either harms the unborn child, uh, which is developing, uh, or the organs are developing, and so it's very sensitive, uh, or the possibility to have children uh, to conceive. Uh, and it could cause allergies, either contact for the skin or respiratory allergies, which is uh, also really something that could be a major harm to individuals. And of course, it could harm the environment and uh, the organism in the environment. And we need to assess these hazards uh, and these exposures. Uh, and that means that we will have the risks. And from that, we can then address them. But we have to do the assessment first. And when we do this assessment, it's very important that we consider that there are vulnerable groups. Not everybody is a healthy uh, grown up or adult. Uh, we also have like children and pregnant women and the unborn child. Uh, and the children are not yet fully developed. Their organisms are, organs are still uh, developing, so they are more sensitive. They also put a lot of things in their mouth. Uh, anybody who's had a small child knows that, uh, which means they're exposed in a different way. 
they also often spend a lot of time on the floor, which is means they are closer to the ground and get dust, uh, uh, inhale dust, for example. So we have to take into account that when we do our risk assessment, we want to protect all people. And we also have to consider gender because uh, female and male are different, the, the susceptibility to harm, um, what harm uh, a certain exposure gives is different for biological reasons. And there's also the social norms, which means that uh, typically the division of labor is not equal between men and women. Uh, and that means that exposure is different. Um, typically men work in a more uh, heavy industry, uh, more chemical intensive industry, whereas women work perhaps more in textile industry and that kind of industry. Uh, so they are exposed to different uh, chemicals in different ways. And it's very important that all have a right uh, to a high level of protection for health. Uh, so we have to consider both uh, the both uh, the typically female work places and the male, typically male workplaces. And also you have to right to be represented in this decision making when you are uh, when you are good, dec deciding on things that affect you. And also access to the resources, the laws, the information, the training, the personal protection equipment. It has to be considered that everybody, all people should be protected, not just the obvious perhaps. And when we address these risks, we want to be prevented. So next, please. And why do we want to be preventive? Well, we, will start, we, we want to start when they are placed on the market. And these are just two examples uh, of why uh, we should be preventive rather than trying to fix things when uh, the problem is already there. I mean, first of all, we want to prevent suffering, of course, but also costs. So healthcare costs, a cost for remediation of contaminated land, etc., and these are sometimes irreversible harm that cannot be uh, possible. It cannot be undone. Uh, it's not possible. So two examples is one is asbestos that was already mentioned. Uh, you had early warnings from around 1900. That's more than 100 years ago. Uh, that they were and they were why and asbestos has been widely used in the EU and in the world. Uh, and it's still even though it was banned in the end of uh, of the 1990s in the EU, there's still a large number of deaths. Uh, I mean, it's estimated to be um, deaths after the ban in the third five year period after the ban, up to 400,000 deaths because of uh, the asbestos. And this is also an example of where we should perhaps use the precautionary principle, which means that in the early 1900s, it wasn't a conclusive uh, scientific evidence to show that it was did give cancer uh, asbestos, but there were strong indications, and that's where you should have acted, uh, even if it was not completely say uh, completely certain. You shouldn't delay acting. Uh, so I've included one of the definitions of the precautionary principle. There are other definitions as well, but basically it's acting before there's absolute certainty if it's uh, required. Another example is the PCB, where, which is being used extensively in um, different uh, electronic equipment, for example, and sealants in paints. And we measure that in Sweden in mother's milk. And this is mother's milk. So that's something for the very vulnerable group of very small children. They are still exposed to this, even though it was banned in 95. Uh, it's still found in mother's milk. And these are not P mothers that work in, in a PCB factory or anything like that. This is statistical samples. Uh, so it's not po possible to do um, really to remove it. Uh, we have to live with this, uh, even though it was new use was banned in 78 in Sweden. Uh, but we still have to live with the, um, the harm from that uh, use more than 40 years ago. So we want to prevent uh, harm rather than do something about it later. And we want to be systematic. So next, please. 
well, we need to be systematic. And so how do we do this? You have to have a setup. Uh, you have to have a legal framework uh, that sets the objectives we want to achieve. For example, high level of protection for human health and environment is typically a good objective. You also have to have clarify the roles and responsibilities uh, of industry along the chemical life cycle, from manufacture to waste and recycling, but also for enforcement, etc. You have to have the instruments in the law. So how do you like registers, pre-market approvals, uh, restriction processes, etc. And this will influence who carries the costs, of course. At least uh, there will be benefits later, but costs, there will be costs uh, at an early stage uh, to do all this. And that is then defined by this. You have to have an institutional arrangement um, to make it operational. Otherwise it will not happen. Just having laws is not enough. Uh, and with that institutions, uh, all the institutions involved, both private sector and public sector, they have to have the capacity, of course, and they have to be coordinated, both between uh, government institutions, between different jurisdictions, but also between national stakeholders and international uh, stakeholders as well, to avoid duplication of work and be effective. So next, please. So what we want this system to deliver? Well, we need how to, to go forward. We need knowledge. Um, Recall the, disc the discussion we had on exposures. So chemicals are everywhere. Now, in the EU, you, you count something between 25,000, 100,000 different chem chemical substances. So we have to know uh, which is the ones we should address first, which are most relevant. So knowledge on the health and environmental hazards. But just having this data in a database or the information in a database is not enough um, if it's hidden there. The users need to have this information. The users of the chemicals, they have to know about the hazards and the precautionary measures they should take. And it's not enough that they know. <laughs> I mean, they also have to act. They have to use chemicals in a safe way. The way they act is important. And some substances, are simply not possible to use safely. I mean, they might be typically uh, substances with irreversible damage and very serious damage. PCB is one that I mentioned. Um, so typically those that give cancer, for example, reprotox that I mentioned, those that are very persistent in the environment that remain a prolonged time in the environment and bioaccumulate, so accumulate in living organisms. Uh, are typically ones that should be phased out, like mercury, uh, persistent organic pollutants in the Stockholm Convention that was mentioned. So how do we do this in practice, this knowledge, information to users, safe use and phase out? So next, please. Well, I've taken EU as an example because that's what I know best, but of course that's just an example. So knowledge, how do we get knowledge or generate knowledge? Well, in the EU, you have pre-market requirements. So if you uh, want to market a chemical, place it on the market, you have to give the data first on environmental and health hazards. So no data, no markets. That's uh, part of the EU REACH regulation. And in other cases like uh, plant protection products, biocidal products, you have to have an authorization to be allowed to sell it. And to get that author authorization, you have to give the data first. And so next step then, how do we get the information to users? That's a very important uh, part. And it's based on the uh, United Nations international system, the, uh, the, globalized, the global harmonized system for classification uh, of hazards and communication of hazards. Uh, in EU, it's called the CLP regulation, classification, labeling, and packaging. So it's very important that, that this gives a format, a language to, to present hazard and precautionary statements. And it's the supplier of the chemical that should do this in the EU. Uh, they classify it in a common language and format. Uh, labels uh, are standardized uh, with the hazard and precautionary statements and the pictogram, you know, the, like uh, the exclamation mark here. 
Uh, professionals get the safety data sheets with information on hazards, safe use, first aid, what to do with spills, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And there's also public databases on hazards and so on. These are open for everyone. So the knowledge is already there. It's free for everyone, no need to log in, just go in and get the data um, from anywhere in the world. So next please. And when it comes to safe use then, how do we use this information? Uh, the users, how do they use it? Well, it's typically uh, in other legislation. So the chemical legislation gives information and on the hazards and the precautionary measures to other legislation that then sets what should be done, like protection of the environment, so uh, environmental permits, workers, health and safety legislation, um, legislation to prevent major accidents, transport, recycling, waste handling. All of these can refer to the chemical legislation, that if it's classified in a certain way, it has to be handled in a certain way. And when it comes to phasing out, uh, the EU has in within the reach uh, a system where they can restrict uh, the use or the manufacture or the placing on the market of an article or a mixture or a substance. Uh, and that can be for a specific, it can be restricted just so that the public cannot use it or completely banned like asbestos uh, or anything in between. And in other cases, uh, there are authorization requirements. So for substances of very high concern in reach, uh, a list of substances and for biocidal products and plant protection products, as I mentioned, you have to have an authorization. And of course you can refuse to give an authorization uh, if you think that it's not safe. Okay, so next please. So the benefits then, uh, what do we benefit from? And this is, uh, looks like a lot of cost. We have to do a lot. Well, there's benefits for everyone. I mean, it helps to achieve the sustainable development goals. It, it's uh, necessary to have this system and uh, preventive and systematic uh, chemicals management. But you can not, it's not only the government that avoids healthcare costs, uh, avoids costs to re remediate contaminated land, and make sure they achieved objectives uh, of the government uh, effectively. But also industry uh, have major uh, advantages or benefits. Uh, they have one system that's foreseeable, they can plan. They don't have to duplicate work. If you have the same system, uh, they, it faci facilitates trade. And of course, the brand value. I mean, no company has as a business idea to give their customers cancer. Um, and people are more and more interested in health and environmental effects. And of course, for the public, the health and well being, um, and also right to know and participate in decision making. You have to have the information to be able to participate. Uh, and that's essential to human rights. So there are major benefits. Uh, even though there are initially some costs. Next, please. So how do we know we're going the right way? Or how do we measure that we are actually uh, doing uh, effective preventive uh, chemicals control? It's not that easy to have indicators. Uh, it's very challenging because you have very complex. There are many chemicals. I said like 25 to 100,000, a number of uses, any number of uses large groups exposed, a long term uh, expo time between, a long time between exposure to effect in many cases, like cancer can take uh, tens, decades, uh, 30 years or more. Uh, so uh, one way is to meet, uh, is to measure and have indicators that's got to do with the regulatory outputs with estimates. So for example, when uh, they reviewed REACH, uh, they have, um, that you have 17,000 substances you have data on that will estimate to be protecting uh, human health and environment. It's more than 7,000, 17,000 now, by the way. And there are a number of restrict restrictions that's now in place, etc. Uh, you could also look at uh, environmental and health outcomes uh, like emissions, uh, if you have uh, registers of that, um, consumption. Uh, so, for example, Sweden uses uh, the percentage of allergenic consumer products as an indicator of moving in the right way, trends. We have environmental objectives where we use that. Uh, environmental monitoring, 
So you have a water framework directive that measures that have a thresholds for various chicals. You have to have long series of time, but of course, by monitoring, I mentioned the PCB in Mother's Milk. That's one example, which is used as an indicator in, once again, in Sweden. Um, but there are, of course, others as well. And you can have uh, epidemiological studies where you study groups of people uh, with the exposure and effect. But these are quite complex and really resource demanding. Uh, so they are often done academically, uh, but it's difficult to do for, for many substances. So uh, next, please. So thank you. Uh, I just want to recap. So as I mean, chemicals surround us uh, and they, we need to control them. We need them and we need to control them. And we need to protect uh, everybody. So including vulnerable groups, we have to take that into account. And we have to have a preventive and systematic approach. Uh, it's not enough to do something after the harm is there. So I'm looking forward to questions in the panel discussion. I think I see one question here now. I'll have looked at soon. Uh, and I also just wanted to add here uh, some more resources. These are things I've picked, uh, you know, information from. Uh, Twenty minutes is a short time to give a presentation on all this. Uh, so these are all downloadable um, for free, of course, uh, and have a lot of information that you could look at if you like. So I'll stop there. Uh, yeah, just, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Borkman, for this very interesting and useful presentation, where we could see a brief overview of chemical control in the market, and the perhaps even more important for us, some of the indicators that confirm the uh, justification of uh, all the legislation that uh, regulate this whole area. I can also say that uh, here in Bosnia-Herzegovina, we are lacking this uh, such reference studies that you developed in in uh, Sweden that you started a uh, long time ago. I hope we'll be able to do something like that here. Just to remind the participants, you can ask questions in the Q&A uh, section already. And I think it's time that we can, we can uh, have the next question, Paul. I will read them. What do you think whether the inspectors should know how to properly uh, assess uh, the, the risk, the hazard, and how to uh, do the classification and marking of the chemicals? And what do you think is the most important for the government bodies to offer to industry in order to ensure uh, adequate implementation? Uh, of regulations or adequate enforcement. Please do answer these questions. And while you are doing that, I'll announce the next uh, speaker, transposition and uh, alignment with EU legislation in uh, non-member countries. This will be presented by Mr. Tobian Lind. We'll wait a few more seconds for the poll to finish, and then we'll go to Mr. Lind. Okay, Paula. Okay, thank you. 
Can we see now the biography of Mr. Lind? So Mr. Torbjorn Lind is a senior advisor for the Swedish uh, Chemical Agency. He has worked as advisor in uh, Croatia, Hungary, Poland, and Tunisia, and as a Swedish advisor to Albania, Macedonia, and Serbia. He participated in four missions in Bosnia Herzegovina in the period May, September 2016. Mr. Lind, you can start. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, happy to be with you. Um, first, I I like to um, just uh, underscore that um, what um, what I will um, deal with today is based on my experience and experience that I share with uh, colleagues uh, um, in George <clears throat> in the Western Balkan countries. Uh, but I will not. Um, specify directly that I'm talking about uh, experience from Croatia or <clears throat> from Serbia, uh, but uh, be more general. Findings that I could say is um, general to, to all countries and uh, would be of interest also to, to Bosnia-Herzegovina for that reason. So now you can uh, go to the next slide, please. Can change slide, please. Uh, for countries that um, uh, approx approximate to the EU legislation in this area, it's it's a virgin area. Um, can, candidate countries have a legislation for workers' health and safety and uh, safe transports, uh, uh, emissions to the environment, etc. environmental legislation since long. But um, uh, what we call chemicals legislation in the EU is uh, something quite new to countries. So they are facing a, a new area and uh, have to uh, establish a, the appropriate framework for that legislation. There are, uh, we could say, new principles that are put into practice. Um, it's prevention. It's about prevention at the uh, most early stage in society when chemicals are placed on the market. Uh, how to handle the risks from the very beginning when chemicals enter society. You can compare it to what has, has been the tradition in the workers' health and safety area with the uh, personal uh, protection equipment. It's also prevention, but it's uh, the very last resort. It's uh, in the other end of the, of the line, so to say. Uh, chemicals legislation is very much about uh, preventing risks from uh, occurring from the beginning. So uh, that is uh, something that you have to count on and uh, that uh, it's, uh, um, there are few persons in the countries that are familiar with this area for that reason. Um, so you start from scratch, you lay the, the ground. Uh, there have to be the effective division of the responsibilities. Uh, you base uh, legislation on parliamentary law, primary law, uh, and you, you build the necessary institutional competence and capacity. Uh, normally from scratch. You lay down the knowledge demands that uh, Mats uh, mentioned, uh, talked about, uh, but also the detailed information requirements about hazards, uh, how to communicate hazards with classification and labeling, communicate risks and precautionary measures. And uh, also you, you um, uh, regulate the free and open access to, to uh, uh, substances, uh, uh, particularly hazardous substances and chemicals and substances also used uh, when they are used in, in articles. We can take the next slide. So to see the rule of chemicals legislation in the EU, 
is important. Uh, so you do not mix it up. The acquis communautaire, the, the EU uh, legislation listed, uh, has the sub chapter about chemicals, and then it's about chemicals legislation in this sense. Uh, workers' health and safety is another chapter. Safe transports uh, is in another chapter. So this chapter is about chemicals legislation in, in uh, basically two senses. Uh, one is uh, the, the communication on hazards, what's to the left in this picture. The classification labeling the safety data sheets that serve chemicals safety in all areas in society where, where chemical risks uh, are a concern. And that uh, you should not just see as a sort of technical uh, thing, something written on the cans or bottles, some technical message. It's uh, um, an important uh, factor for the choice of chemicals. Uh, if you know uh, the classification, if you have uh, possibilities to see the, the, the potential risks, then you can also choose other chemicals. You can adjust your choices and your, also your, your choice of, of uh, technique. And you can do that in a quite a, a short time compared to the perspective of investments, because many times you can substitute chemicals for less hazardous chemicals almost overnight or during at least the short period of time in, in comparison to, to investments that have a 10 year perspective. The other main component is what I mentioned, the prohibitions and restrictions of particularly hazardous chemicals and uh, substances of our high concern. So um, this is taken care of from the beginning. Uh, there is the reduced uh, allowed uh, use for, for uh, these substances. It's about uh, say 1,200 substances that somehow are restricted in the EU. And since it's made from the beginning, that they do not appear on the market for those purposes that are restricted. You can compare it with the traditional environmental legislation where you have used to have permits at the sites when you already are using the, the chemicals. You have the permit to, to uh, contaminate to a minor uh, uh, extent, uh, but you, still you have the, the pollution. Uh, in this case, uh, we have uh, the system that, that substances are not allowed to, to be placed on the market for, for the most risky uh, uses. And that way we also uh, hinder the, the risk from occurring. We are uh, preventing the potential risks. And... Um, this you should not uh, perceive as, as uh, impossible somehow, that, that it's very difficult to restrict. We have done it. It's not common in the world, I should say, compared to the US, for example, we have uh, with our about 1,200 restrictions, we have, uh, uh, we could compare to the US where they have about a dozen. And most countries have no restrictions uh, apart from what they are what they have um, undertaken in regard to uh, multilater multilateral uh, conventions like the Stockholm Convention. So um, what's in the, in the white uh, part of the, of the slide supporting the use of safe chemicals and safety techniques everywhere in society? It's the rule of chemicals legislation in relation to other legislation about chemicals. Uh, it, uh, it supports with knowledge and information and with restrictions, food safety, the protection of children, uh, safe waste disposals, et cetera. We can change the slide now. Um, nowadays, this area is uh, fully harmonized so, and it's codified. 
And you could say that we have a community system for chemicals management. Compared to earlier, when the countries entered the EU in 2004 or 1995, we had the directives. It, it uh, wasn't fully harmonized yet. Um, and we are mainly uh, speaking about the CLP regulation, the REACH regulation, the biocidal product regulation, and uh, uh, the Rotterdam and Stockholm conventions in this area. We can take the next slide. And here I, I try to give a picture, a metaphor for what, uh, what, what a community system stands for. Uh, it's like uh, entering a, a ship. Uh, once you enter the EU, you enter the community system. You cannot enter it before. You have to prepare for entering it. You can, um, you, and you are supposed to implement um, uh, important parts of the regulations, but you cannot uh, implement uh, uh, all the rules in this, uh, all the provisions in, in these systems that stipulate the membership. Uh, the ship uh, is uh, where, the, where to navigate the ship is decided by the 27 members. Uh, the navigation tools and how to staff the, the ship is the Euro European Chemicals Agency and the member state competent authorities of staffing the ship. Uh, so this is the situation you encounter as a candidate country, and it could be uh, quite difficult to, to see really what it means. And, and that has been the case, I should say, in all candidate countries, because uh, you mix it up, this system with the regulations that build up a community system. You mix it up with the directives that are directives uh, to uh, establish national systems. And we could look at the next uh, slide then, where I tried the same metaphor to show how it works with, for example, the, the Cerveso Directive. Each uh, member state has uh, arranged for and established um, a system to prevent and control major chemical accidents through the Cerveso 3 Directive. And that is something that the candidate country can and should and should do uh, uh, as well. So you could say that during uh, uh, pre-accession, you can build your, your sailing boat and uh, you can be fully ready with your Cerveso system and uh, you can enter the, the EU with that system, a national system for preventing and controlling major chemical accidents. And that those are also uh, minimum requirements, so uh, you can be more ambitious. Certain, um, certain basic demands are common principles and requirements. But um, as for example, in Italy, you can find very ambitious um, systems for, for uh, um, in this area. And then you enter and there are 27 already sailing boats in place. So you enter the fleet and we cooperate with each other. But those are national systems uh, in comparison to the community systems. And they, they are stuffed uh, each one with national core administration people, uh, administrative and technical staffers. We can take the next slide. These are things that um, um, you are supposed to, um, to uh, establish before being able to, to, um, to be able to, to uh, take on the EU regulations and the cooperation. Uh, so during pre-accession, trade and industry have to get a good understanding of chemicals legislation their obligations and the uh, demands. 
that will be there in place on accession day, if not earlier. Uh, you have to ensure that you have enforcement provisions and resources, institutional resources, um, so, so that you can um, uh, comply with your member state obligations, participate in the REACH system, in the CLP uh, activities on the community level. And um, also that you can um, uh, provide uh, expertise to, to the work of ECA for risk assessment and um, socioeconomic analysis. Uh, if you have um, if you have to have uh, transition arrangements and it's normal, you, you put it in the accession agreement that, that you uh, um, um, that will come, uh, let's say, a half a year before uh, accession. You will have the accession agreement in place. Uh, these are uh, things that, that you um, have to have uh, in national legislation. So when you enter the EU, you have to have a national legislation showing um, what, what is the competent authority, uh, what is the inspection, uh, who is, is the inspection in this area. Uh, you have to have the panel, penalty provisions in place. And uh, also you have to have uh, help desk resources for the three regulations, uh, REACH, uh, CLP and, and the bicycle products. Uh, help desk to, to help um, industry navigate in the, in the legislation. You can take the next slide. So uh, indispensable to uh, transpose and to put in practice in due time before accession to be prepared for membership is the classification labeling and packaging provisions that uh, implement the uh, GHS, the Global Harmonized System for Classification and Labeling, the UN system, and uh, the safety data sheet requirements also from the GHS. Um, then there is um, the classification and labeling uh, on the individual basis of certain substances uh, in, the, in the EU, um, substances of very high concern, active substances in biocides and also active substances in pesticides. Centrally decided classifications, precisely how a substance should be classified. Normally, it's the general requirements on importers and manufacturers to um, classify and label uh, chemicals and substances. But in this case, when it comes to, to this kind of substances, um, cancerogenes, uh, mutagenes, uh, reprotoxic substances, um, uh, substances that are uh, irritants to the respiratory tract uh, uh, and others, um, the same concern. We have, we have this system of, of a centrally decided classification and that classification you can uh, introduce this list of uh, classification and labeling of individual substances you, you can introduce during pre-accession to have in place in due time and you can and you are supposed to also to uh, establish the prohibitions and restrictions. You can uh, uh, introduce the list of substances of very high concern, the, uh, the candidate list that has a certain um, um, importance for the requirements of, when it comes to chemical substances and articles. Um, most countries did that uh, during pre-accession. And then uh, when it comes to, to the conventions, there are some further demands in the, in the EU regulations. For example, the export-import regulation uh, requires uh, that you should um, uh, notify the export, not just of the substances listed under the Rotterdam Convention, when you 
your companies in your country export to another country. Uh, you should uh, notify the export also of a long list of EU uh, substances, EU uh, restrictions of substances, other substances. Um, and that is also something that you, you normally, countries normally establish before, before membership. You can look at the others. Next slide then. Um, at the same time, you should keep in mind, and, and that has been the problem for uh, issue for many times in the candidate countries, that you cannot uh, establish the procedures, the parallel procedures to the EU procedures. You can um, issue the lists of restrictions, you can issue the list of substances of our high concern, you can issue the list of um, of a classification of a labeling of, of uh, the, those particularly hazardous substances, but you cannot um, introduce the same kind of procedures as the EU, because then you are starting to have a parallel procedures and you, you will take your, your decisions on, other ba on another basis and in another context than the EU. And it could be uh, also already formally, it will be a sort of competition with the EU and you will get results from your procedures that are not in tune with the EU decisions. So you, to introduce the procedures, it's not, it's not supposed to be done in the candidate country and it isn't done in the member states because these are community systems. I refer back to what I said. These are community systems. So the member states do not have those kind of procedures on the national level. They are participating in these procedures at the community level. So the candidate country shouldn't, shouldn't have the procedures neither. Well, to, uh, we can take the last slide then. I've tried just to uh, indicate the roadmap. This is based on how countries have done it. You start uh, and you need two, three years to establish the framework law with the basic obligations, with the clear mandates, and also uh, uh, lay the ground with the with the legislation for uh, sustainable funding financing with enforcement provisions etc and um, industry and trade uh, have to get engaged uh, at this early stage uh, in this area then uh, th th that could be about five years of building capacity both within industry and trade and uh, in the state core administration. Uh, you issue the application rules, the secondary legislation could be a stepwise introduction of, uh, of the information and communication demands, classification and labeling, as was done, uh, for example, in, in Republika Serbska. Uh, you can start with the requirements for on substances and then you can have in some two or three years time uh, the same demands for the classification and labeling of mixtures and uh, well then uh, the last two years you make yourself ready industry trade government uh, you discuss the possible transition um, agreements in the accession agreement and um, and you prepare for the laws that you need as a member state that I mentioned about um, what is the competent authority who is the who has the inspection duties uh, what are the penalty provisions uh, uh, and uh, uh, where is the help desk seated the help desks for the various regulations. 
And that means that you are ready then to take on uh, member state responsibilities uh, in the community systems and cooperate with the other member states. So altogether, it could be a 10 years perspective for, for this. And um, in uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, you are in a sort of uneven uh, situation where uh, the Republika Serbska started this process uh, long ago and, and uh, hopefully uh, uh, the other parts, the Federation and, and the Brisco, town of Brisco, could um, keep up with it and, and uh, that it could um, uh, be done uh, uh, faster, possibly, in, in the rest of the, of the country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lin, for this very valuable and uh, interesting presentation, as you've uh, noticed well, and we can see that you know the situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina very well. Uh, we have a different situation in various parts in the Publica Srpska. We are quite advanced in this process, but uh, in the Federation and the Butchko district, uh, we only have to engage in activities uh, to set up the system now. And uh, I, I know I am, I'm aware that we need to accelerate the process and uh, we want to make it uh, make this uh, time shorter than 10 years uh, and as you reiterated uh, on several occasions you actually proposed that we should not uh, set up parallel procedures to the eu procedures because uh, i have a feeling sometimes that uh, we need to transpose all the directives and regulations as such and as a whole and you showed here and you explained that we didn't do to do uh, don't do, uh, need to do so that we only need to be well prepared and do it our way thank you very much yes. and, uh, when it comes to um, to uh, regulate these regulations yes for example if you look at the reach the reach regulation could say that there is about 70% of the provisions that are designed for and presuppose membership. So they, they address the member state, not the candidate country. If you count on the number of, uh, of articles, you will find out that less than 30% of the articles are possible to, to uh, implement. That's one thing, but it's also the other thing that, um, the REACH regulation is designed and made for the vast area of the European econom economic area, the, the community market, the common market. So it presupposes the strength of the industry in, in the EU that the, the big producers of, the, of the substances are under the jurisdiction, that you have a more or less complete supply chains that so you can put demands on the actors in the ch supply chain, uh, that you have access to the resources of 27 member states and the, and the Central uh, Chemicals Agency, the ECA. Uh, th those are conditions that can never be met by, by a normal, normalized country. So the whole system is designed in a way that it's impossible to have a parallel setup. You will not be able to generate and finance the, the data search. You will not be able to, to um, uh, accomplish the, the joint uh, or share the cooperation for uh, compiling safety data sheets that, that uh, there is in the EU, et cetera. So um, this, this was very much mixed up in the beginning in Serbia, for example, they got early on in the procedure, the advice to have a sort of blue copy of the rich regulation, the procedures, something that is impossible really. And it's not uh, at all required uh, or um, um, 
you can uh, it from the metaphor that I had with the with the sailing ship. Thank you very much once again for this useful advice and now it's the time for our break but just before the break may i ask uh, for another set of questions from the poll and then we will have a break of 10 minutes after our participants re answer this question we are lagging behind slightly because uh, the presentations were interesting uh, i did not want to interrupt or to restrict anyone's time this is very significant and useful for us uh, and after the questions are answered then uh, i suggest uh, uh, to reconvene on uh, 10 25 you don't need to log out but uh, i will read the question what do you think uh, how, when will the new uh, regulation ensure that the uh, chemicals are adequately classified uh, and uh, labeled the technical list and do you think that sorry i lost do you think that uh, you need to know the regulations in the area of uh, chemical management for export of uh, products in EU countries uh, which are not chemicals, such as furniture, toys, uh, clothes? And we will have several questions from the, uh, our participants. And if anyone wants to comment on these questions or the others, uh, you will have an opportunity. I apologize. This is the end of the poll. Uh, well, if Melina agrees, perhaps. Uh, we could uh, prolong the break until 10.30. I don't think this 15 minutes uh, will make major difference. Yeah, I agree, I agree, 15 minutes. So see you at 10.30, thank you. I hope we had enough time to uh, take a brief rest and that now we can continue with our presentation. The next one is uh, chemical safety and uh, useful experiences uh, from the neighborhood uh, case study from Serbia. This will be a joint presentation. And first we'll hear Ms. Yasminka Rangelovic. She is the program coordinator of the organization Alternative for Safer Chemicals, ALHEM, a civil society organization which promotes uh, uh, reduced risk of hazardous chemicals aimed at protection of human health and environment. She implements international projects in the area of chemical management and uh, works as a consultant for chemical management uh, in the public administration. She's worked on development of the national strategy 
and uh, management of chemicals uh, and chemical uh, products. Uh, and as an inspector for control of chemicals, and she is also worked as a Republic inspector for chemicals. She is actively engaged in activities of international organizations like Coalition 27, Ms. Rangelovic. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to greet all the participants in today's meeting and to thank the organizers for inviting us and for recognizing our experience in, this, in doing this work in Serbia. Just very briefly to introduce my organization, Alhem. This is Alternative for Safer Chemicals. It was established in 2013, and it gathers experts with many years of experience in this area. What we advocate is the safe uh, chemical management in Serbia for the purpose of reducing the risk of the chemicals may pose to the health of people and the environment. We work in uh, Serbia, but we are also members of some international organizations uh, active in this field. The IPEN, the International Network uh, for Future Without Toxic Chemicals, then the largest European organization for environment protection, the EEB, and uh, a member of the Working Group for Chemicals, and the organization HEAL, Health and Environmental alliance uh, with the seat in Brussels that is working on protection of health of people and uh, specifically the chemical impact on health. We are a member of an informal association, the network that's called Coalition 27, that uh, monitors the process of Serbia's succession to the European Union and progress uh, achieved under chapter 27 that concerns the environment. In this coalition, we are responsible for chemical management. And uh, one characteristic of the Coalition 27 is that every year we publish a report on the progress uh, in Serbia on this path uh, to European integration in connection with the accession process. And we come up with a set of recommendations what uh, all the stakeholders need to do in order to achieve the objectives and meet the requirements uh, of the EU in this context. Our most important, we have several target audiences and we work of course with the decision makers in this process. We work uh, to improve policies in this field by public advocacy with the responsible agencies in accordance with the international policy of chemical management and policies of the European Union. We also work as the watchdog organization to monitor how the uh, legislation is actually enforced in practice, uh, specifically the legislation in Serbia, because uh, sometimes we worked uh, on establishment of the regulatory framework and but now as the civil society organization we are monitoring the implementation of these uh, results and we are trying to do at least once a year the testing of products and to check uh, how the restriction of use of substances in the general use projects is implemented and we publish these results in our reports and uh, later share that with uh, the uh, competent bodies and uh, citizens uh, to take uh, measures in this uh, field and all those who are uh, putting these products in the market. We also work with commercial entities. We are trying to find uh, the ways to share the information that we have that we receive from the European institutions active in industry and also the NGO sector. 
about the chemicals that they use in their production processes and what are the safer alternatives. We are promoting this substitution process. Typically, we work through the Chamber of Commerce of Serbia with the Association of Chemical Producers and the Trade Association because they gather most of the importers and distributors of not only chemicals, but also the products containing hazardous chemicals. So we work directly with companies, especially in relation to the uh, substances causing concern. And our, the, our broadest target audience are the citizens. We help them be protected from the hazardous chemicals by making the right choice and uh, uh, implementing the uh, correct protection measures, not only against the chemicals and the uh, mixtures, but also the products containing chemicals. And we work with other civil society organizations in Serbia in order to help in view of our limited capacities to fulfill our mission and vision related to the safe management of chemicals. We consider particularly important the cooperation with the Consumers Association, and we are implementing some joint activities, some joint projects, and we provide each other this uh, technical knowledge that uh, is required in this uh, field. Before in 2015, before we started uh, implementing major projects, we did uh, an analysis of uh, perception, public perception, uh, with respect to the chemical safety, to see what the citizens think and how do they behave uh, with respect to the chemicals. And we did with an agency that uh, uh, is uh, doing normally the public uh, opinion surveys. This was the first survey that we did, and uh, this is used for us to uh, measure our own impact, uh, not only of the Alhem, but also other um, stakeholders active in the field. So these initial associations, when it comes to chemicals, what comes to mind of ordinary citizens are in a negative context. The red, uh, the chemicals are unhealthy, harmful for environment, dangerous, and they have, uh, uh, they show a much higher percentage than the opinion that the chemicals are useful, effective, modern, uh, innovative, etc. So the first association is negative. We also asked the citizens to what extent they recognize the presence of chemicals in the general use products, uh, like the clothes, uh, toys, plastic toys, electronics. Uh, and this was interesting. Almost 85% of people recognize and are aware that chemicals are not only the household uh, products or construction products, that they are everywhere. Majority believes that they cannot be eliminated from everyday life, and they uh, believe that the new chemicals do not contribute to healthier environment. So mostly the, con the association is negative. In the opinion of citizens on what are the products that are the highest chemical risk, the citizens recognized with convincing majority the pesticides and insecticides, the agricultural pesticides and biocides, specifically insecticides, because uh, this is the group of products that citizens uh, uh, often get in contact with. And these are the group of products where the supplier needs to get the permit from the competent body prior to placing them in the market as opposed to other chemical products. Detergents uh, come second. They are considered uh, to be a risk, then cleaning products, gardening products, cosmetics, construction products. Then come the toys, electronics, clothes and footwear, uh, furniture, etc. 
One question concerned the labeling specifically of the chemicals, the substances and uh, mixtures, because we wanted to see whether the citizens, the consumers read the instructions for use. In 2015, we had um, some regulations in force about the uh, classification, packaging and labeling that was in line with the European CLP uh, regulation and uh, international uh, globally harmonized system. And some pictograms were already on the chemicals. The results showed that around 60% of citizens sometimes or often or always read the labels on the chemical products while 40 percent very rarely or never but we also wanted to learn uh, amongst those who do read the labels whether they really adhere with the instructions uh, provided on the label and the answer was fully half of the responses were fully adhered to 43 partially but this percentage if uh, this is the share of those who do read the labels, but if we consider it as a share of the total population, uh, we can say that 33% uh, of citizens read the labels and adhere to the instructions. So in 2015, we uh, had a very large room to act in terms of educating the population on on the labeling and uh, communication so the activities of the alham and at that time were focused on on this topic labeling the chemicals and recognizing the pictograms so in our on our site we have even a quiz the, where the citizens can test their knowledge. Later on, uh, we moved more towards the testing of the products in general use, but related to the risk assessment and the proper use of chemicals. In addition to prohibitions and restrictions, these are the two aspects that are the most important for controlling the risk of uh, hazardous chemicals. We also wanted to hear what the citizens thought about uh, whom would they trust most in case of the chemical safety. Doctors and medical institutions, 37%, the competent body, 33% uh, centers for uh, poison control. That's also part of the health system. So we can say that 60% lay most of their confidence in the health institutions. Scientific 23. Um, and suppliers are to be believed by only 20%. NGOs 9% and media only 3%. European Union and its institution were mentioned by only 5%. But this percentage, we assume, has changed over time. And we should probably repeat this survey with some of these questions to see what's the current uh, opinion. What was important to us was that the doctors, the health sectors, should uh, be involved and included in this area from the very beginning. So who is responsible to ensure the chemical safety? In the view of the citizens, the competent uh, government body, 23%, the producers, 13%, both 61%. And this is, this corresponds uh, to the reality according to the REACH directive and the law on chemicals, the suppliers are not only the producers, but importers, distributors, and uh, traders are responsible for uh, safety of the projects. But there is also the competent body who needs to pass the uh, legislation and uh, establish the inspections. 
The last question was about harmonization with the EU legislation. Do the citizens believe that this harmonization, legislative harmonization, contributes to better safety? And 50% said yes. 20 that they disagreed, and some 30% think that that would not contribute to the safer market, which is not negligible. So these were the answers given in 2015. In 2017, when we repeated just some of the questions, mostly uh, related to the part uh, on the classification, packaging, and labeling, because we wanted to see uh, how the awareness of the consumers changes of time. We saw some much better results in terms of recognizing pictograms uh, and the part uh, related to the uh, substances that uh, raise concern. And we asked, do you know that you have the right as a, a consumer to request information about the presence of the hazardous chemicals and uh, substances that cause concern in the product. 29% said that they were aware of uh, this uh, right, but only 2% used this right. And based on this survey, the first project that was done in uh, Serbia, the first one of the first major projects that was implemented in cooperation with the competent body and the consumers associations and the UNDP, and the one organization from uh, Germany, a CSO organization from Germany, was very important uh, in terms of development of this system in Serbia. This was uh, financed by the SICOM, the International uh, Association for uh, Chemical Management Policies at international level, and it was implemented in 2015 and 16. And its objective was to link all the stakeholders who were interested in this area in Serbia. First of all, the competent authorities, not only the ministry that's responsible for environment, where the Department for Chemicals is uh, placed, uh, this body is responsible for the implementation of the law on chemicals. There is also the part of the Ministry of Health that contains some of the inspection and other regulations that have to do with chemicals, such as the law on products, uh, objects of general use, that includes uh, toys, cosmetics, products that uh, uh, get in contact uh, with the skin, and uh, the ministry that's competent for trade and consumer protection that applies to the retail sale of chemicals. And uh, it also includes the inspections. Uh, the UNDP as the implementing agency to uh, civil society organizations, it was us and our German colleagues, WECF. The project uh, was implemented uh, by two, by three major consumer associations from Novi Sad, Belgrade and Mish, because we wanted to cover as much of Serbia as uh, we could. Uh, we involved the Institute for Public Health, Batut, uh, City uh, Institute for Public Health, Belgrade, and the Chamber of Commerce, who represented the business sector. So the project was uh, about the uh, substances that cause uh, concern, the ones uh, that are according to the legislation classified as carcinogen, mutagen, or toxic for reproduction, and uh, very persistent and bioaccumulative. And uh, this group also includes the substances that uh, represent uh, the uh, uh, substances that uh, may act as endocrine disrupting chemicals. At this site of the European Chemical Agency, you can find uh, 211 substances, and uh, it's, uh, there is also a list of candidate lists, which is updated twice, twice a year, typically in January and June. So it's very important uh, when the secondary legislation is adopted and the list of substances 
that it is regularly updated. The project also engaged uh, in verification to see how this Article 27, which corresponds to Article 33 in the REACH regulation uh, and uh, in the law of the Federation and the law of uh, Republika Srpska, this is Article 37, which says that manufacturers, importers and distributors of products could have obligation to provide in the supply chain information needed for safe use of the product at the request of consumers. So the consumer, this information is not available on the label of the products. Uh, these products are still on the market and that's legal while they're still on this list, while they are not uh, shifted to the list of uh, bans uh, when they will need the authorization that is implemented uh, at the level of the EU. So the, it is important that the only mechanism, the tool is for consumers to take an active approach to seek to obtain information. They should be aware that they have this right to contact the provider uh, or, or a trader where they purchase the product uh, to obtain information. On the basis of their answer they receive uh, from the supplier, then they can take an informed decision whether they will buy the product or not. Let me just mention that the supplier is under the obligation to provide such answer if the concentration of the substance is more than 0.1 percent. That was uh, one of the purposes of the project to see how a legal obligation or provision is implied in the practice, is applied in the practice, uh, uh, especially among the traders in retail and suppliers. However, how this is implied uh, in practice, Alhem uh, worked together with three associations of consumers and requests were sent to 90 distributors in the retail and we requested information about 90 products that belong to the groups that you see on the slide. It is a quite, uh, quite broad range of products. And these are the products uh, which uh, are produced from plastic, the soft plastic, mainly on the basis of polyvinyl chloride, and uh, where we could assume that uh, it is very likely that uh, we will find some phthalates which is uh, used uh, for softening of plastic. What did show this uh, survey from 19, 90 distributors, 92%, 52% responded, but only 22 responded what we asked. The rest of them did provide an answer, but they did not answer very specific question. And the question was very clear whether this product uh, under the serial number of the product contains any of the substances which is on, on the candidate list. 22% responded, provided answers, and all these 22.2% uh, uh, said that their products do not contain any of uh, these uh, SVHC. We then uh, conducted a test in an accredited laboratory and uh, of all these uh, products, 27% were positive on phthalates. Mostly uh, we found this in cables, uh, floors, uh, platings, uh, footwear, household tools and equipment beach equipment. After that, we used 
this uh, not really to control these manufacturers because uh, the presence of these mixtures, uh, these compounds, compounds is not banned except for uh, children care products and toys. That's only where they're banned, but they are allowed in all other products. But this is the way we wanted to make sure that uh, uh, consumers uh, uh, are in a position to take an informed decision whether to buy a product or not. As you can see, a number of toys were tested positive. Uh, the relevant body, the Ministry of uh, Environment, together with the sanitary inspection, uh, conducted several inspections, and uh, these uh, children care products uh, and uh, some uh, some other toys were removed from the markets, some bibs or, or so. This information was used in order to uh, carry out various activities uh, in contact directly with the citizens and industry to raise the awareness of uh, this topic and especially uh, about the presence of SVHC in products. We also produced some materials, uh, inform information materials for uh, citizens, uh, advising them how they can avi avoid uh, the uh, buying such toys and uh, how to, uh, and we also issued one publication in relation to uh, detergents uh, and cleaning material for households uh, together with the associations of uh, consumers uh, we uh, organize some local events uh, during the consumers week it takes place every day, every year in march uh, uh, we will have soon the the day of consumers and we always use this day to carry out some joint activities uh, with the associations of uh, consumers and we focus on chemicals. We also held two media conferences together with the responsible body and we also hold, held a, a workshop for journalists. Uh, that's also very important uh, and we so seek to gather journalists on an annual basis, the journalists which cover this topic and uh, it is not easy to find the scope in the media to cover this topic. These are mainly the journalists which uh, cover environmental issues, protection of consumers, and uh, uh, since recently, increasingly, they focus on human rights because uh, the right uh, to health and the right to information is guaranteed uh, in the Constitution. So there are a lot of common activities which we can take and uh, which touch upon human rights. We also organized uh, a seminar. Uh, thank you. What we would like to stress is satellite symposium, endocrine disruptors, and women health, uh, which we carried out together with the health sector. The uh, doctors were involved and specialists, and we had a side event uh, focusing on the topic of endocrine disruptors, uh, and we hosted uh, the most uh, distinguished uh, doctors from all over Europe. This uh, was also the results of this conference uh, were also presented at the regional conference in Poland, and uh, it was considered to be a good example of cooperation of all stakeholders that uh, are engaged uh, in activities on this topic. Then we continued our cooperation with the uh, Public Health Institute Batut, uh, and uh, we organized a conference on endocrine disruptors. Uh, so we involved the health sector since the beginning, uh, and that's what you should do in Bosnia. 
uh, we also continued uh, uh, covering uh, various uh, SAHC. Uh, we uh, mainly uh, uh, focus on ballet, uh, recycling of hazardous waste and uh, hazardous chemicals in uh, various products, but you can find all this publication on our website. And at the end, I would like to finish with the applications, uh, com communication. What happened? Instead of exchanging letters and emails, uh, uh, seeking to uh, obtain uh, information about uh, SVHCs, uh, we uh, launched a live Ask Reach project uh, and uh, we designed an application for mobile phones, uh, which uh, entitled Scan for Cam. It is an IT tool which uh, can be uploaded to uh, smartphones and you can send your requests automatically in order to receive answers from suppliers. This project is implemented by 20 organizations from 13 countries of the EU and it is interesting to note that this is a project uh, which is implemented by the Environmental Agency of uh, Germany, then Kemi, then the Danish uh, responsible authority, but the others are civil society organizations and academia. So it is a joint uh, project and initiative. Uh, Alhem from Serbia is the only partner which is outside of the EU in this project. And we are also managing and administering this application for Serbia, Montenegro, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. And if I may mention at the end, this application is available in Bosnia and Herzegovina since December last year. And uh, I uh, encourage all the participants who have interest to upload this application. You have can find more detailed information on our site, on our website. And uh, instructions for use but it is uh, designed in such a way that you don't need any any instructions the goal is uh, not only to send information uh, send the request and obtain information but uh, also to provide companies with information about svhc this is a case where a producer can uh, sends their products to the database and uh, the consumer will immediately have information whether the product uh, contains SPHC or not. So you don't need to wait 42 days. You have uh, information at the point when you are buying the product and you can take an informed decision as you buy the product. Uh, you can find uh, multiple information about the, uh, on the site uh, of the EU project Ask Reach. And I should also note that two organizations from Bosnia and Herzegovina, Eco Forum from Zenica and Center for Environment from Banja Luka showed interest to promote this application in Bosnia and Herzegovina and Eco Forum from Zenica in December published the information about this and uh, we are very happy to provide all the necessary support to organizations uh, and of course the responsible body from Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, to, to, uh, to distribute this application. And we are happy to provide all the materials uh, we may have on this topic. So this is the end of my presentation, my part of the presentation concerning the activities of Alhem. And our slogan has been is that the chem chemicals among us are good thing except for situations when they are not. Thank you, Ms. Arangelovic, for this presentation. I will try to restrain from plentiful positive uh, comments. I, I will only say that it is impressive that uh, your civil society has uh, conducted so much activity, so many activities, and that you have so many information that you shared with us. Now I will uh, give the floor to uh, Ms. Uh, Valdina Mart. Valdina Mart is a 
consultant to engage in projects related to safe chemical management in the organization alternative for safer chemicals management alhem and its founder until 2013 she worked on development of chemical management system in the serbian authorities she is a creator of laws and other regulations in this area and all other components essential for the implementation of the legislation including establishment of the agency for chemicals. She was executive officer responsible for technical streamlining of activities in chemical management in this agency. And uh, she worked on the ratification and implementation of international instruments in the area of chemicals management. She was also responsible for the strategic approach to the international chemicals management SAICM. Ms. Matt, you had the floor. I hope you can hear me well. Yes, and we can see your presentation. I will try to uh, speak uh, less than my colleague because we said a lot of things at the beginning. Uh, let me share with you that uh, I believe you are very patient and eager to hear a lot of information that we have provided in this area and I hope uh, I will keep your attention. It is truly a pleasure to be with you here today and uh, we are only several hundred kilometers away from Bosnia and Herzegovina, a few hours drive, but uh, uh, the majority of chemicals we discussed today do not recognize borders at all, and um, it is not a simple. You cannot only address the problems on your side of the border, and uh, we cannot say that we will work only in Serbia and uh, resolve the problem. And I think this is the reason why Sweden is uh, providing support to all other countries to achieve the level uh, which uh, of safety, which will prevent chemicals to travel across the continent. You've heard uh, about my experience, and I have been in the non-governmental sector for seven years, but I was I co-authored the law on uh, chemicals. Uh, I cannot see who are participants, but I hope that uh, our dear colleagues who visited us in the Ministry of Environment and uh, Chemical Agency, mostly from Republika Srpska, who visited us and who tried to obtain uh, some uh, knowledge and information we had at that time and who worked together of us uh, to create this uh, chemicals management safety system. Bear with me for a second, please. As for my experience, uh, this area is like a puzzle. Uh, Mr. Dodion mentioned this and Mr. Metz also. In order to set up a system that you fully control chemicals in the field, you must uh, uh, provide all the necessary regulations to design all the necessary regulations. And those in Republika Srpska who completed this process understood, understand that this process was not an easy. Perhaps it was easier for us because they had some regulations and directives translated into our language. So that made it uh, a bit easier for them. And we had our own legislation in place. Uh, as you could hear from Mr. Torbjorn, uh, this, these regulations can be harmonized only 70% with the EU. So it took a lot, us a lot of thinking uh, uh, to know how to devise the strategy which will, will, will be relevant for Serbia. So we understand that it is not easy for you. And we are happy to see that the Federation also has uh, the law on chemicals in place now. What was also important for me, because I was quite lonely when I was drafting this law, it was necessary to um, 
make sure I have an adequate number of people who will together with me carry out the whole process uh, and uh, set up a chemical control system. So there were a lot of people uh, whom we ne needed to train and educate uh, in administrative work and uh, chemicals management activities. As for inspectors, the uh, that was not something uh, that the environmental inspectors did previously. So the knowledge of, the, of inspectors was uh, different. And in order to control a product and the, uh, the, whether it is uh, properly classified and whether the safety uh, certificate uh, has been prepared in a proper way, the inspectors needed to be trained and that required time so they needed to learn how to conduct control of chemicals then uh, there was not sufficient knowledge in the industry we uh, that was required uh, for the uh, approximation uh, one of the titles in the uh, media at that time uh, said that this was one of the most complex regulations adopted at the EU level. So we set up a help desk. Uh, this uh, I use this term in English because uh, that's uh, widely used. Uh, this is an office which is supposed to help you. We also uh, designed uh, several instructions uh, in the Serbian language, and we organized several uh, uh, trainings uh, for consultants and uh, for it, the industry. We thought this was an important part uh, of the whole story in order to move everything forward. What is also extremely important is that uh, nearly 15 years, for nearly 15 years, we have been receiving uh, assistance from chemicals uh, agency of Sweden and from the peoples of Sweden. They have been helping us to regulate this area in our country in a proper way. I should say that at the time when I was drafting the legislation, I was quite lonely. I felt lonely and the support, the knowledge, the instructions and advice which came from the Swedish project were the major help in my work, most crucial help. And uh, the, the currently employed uh, in Serbia, we are still implementing this project with Sweden and I received uh, assistance from Torbjörn, which was uh, highly adequate. And I think this is a very complex process. And uh, this kind of a project from EU level can help a lot to countries seeking to regulate their, uh, their chemicals management. I should say that we also had assistance from some other EU projects, uh, including the twinning project uh, uh, where we had assistance from uh, officials from uh, Austria, Germany and Slovenia. It was also a significant project and it came at the right moment when we had in people who were employed, uh, civil servants who already understood what the twinning project could offer. This was something entirely different from what Kemi project uh, offered us, uh, and uh, they helped us also engage uh, some uh, national experts who helped us with the terminology and everything. Regarding the project and the inspection control, uh, you need to think about laboratory capacities, which will help uh, control all the bans or compliance with the bans that are in place in the legislation. Through this twinning project I mentioned, we received uh, uh, assistance and uh, funds for portable devices, uh, which we could use to control uh, the uh, the products on the market. So this is something you need to take into account when developing strategy. Regarding monitoring and biomonitoring, 
biomonitoring is not uh, that uh, strongly represented, but in uh, the law on chemicals has uh, an article which has not been used uh, fully yet, uh, which says that it is necessary to systemically monitor what is going on in that area. You've heard today from one of the Swedish experts that there is an EU project uh, uh, for chemicals that are regulated uh, by the EU regulation, which measures the quantities of uh, the uh, content of these chemicals in the blood or in uh, other organs. So you will need to carry out measuring because uh, in order to know whether you have achieved everything that the regulations should have achieved. And at the end, I should say that knowledge of consumers and support by the non-governmental sector is very important. We unfortunately canceled the chemical agency. We, uh, because there was not sufficient understanding why this area needed to be uh, regulated in this way. And as you heard from Swedish experts, uh, uh, the crucial in these regulations, and you have uh, already transposed some of them in the in the Public of Canada the Federation. It is uh, very, uh, it is crucial to have the label. First, it is uh, important to uh, assess properly how hazardous a chemical is, and then it is necessary to communicate about well, this uh, hazard, uh, this uh, level of hazardous. Uh, after several years of application of the law and the regulations, I should say that this part of marking and laboring is uh, operating well. When you uh, visit a shop in Serbia, when you buy things there, you can see the content of labels. And there is another point which is very important in my view, even perhaps even more important uh, are the bans and restrictions. That's a regulation that must be controlled properly. You must have a list of banned substances and uh, uh, and uh, as Yasminka mentioned, uh, the ban on phthalates, uh, which is uh, banned in toys, but uh, in EU it is banned uh, for all products. Now, when we speak about Serbia 10 years after, I believe that our research showed that we are still not implementing the control properly, and that's very important. Although we had some uh, information about Serbian market, I should say that uh, the bands are not easily controlled even in Europe. Uh, there are some reports you can see in one of the screen, and they discuss uh, whether chemicals are, are well regulated and whether you can find some banned chemicals on the market. In some countries, uh, the pellets uh, had been banned 20 years ago, but 20% of inspected toys, uh, uh, they, they, they have a special system to select samples and uh, to determine whether a toy is should be suspected or not, but 20% of inspected toys in this uh, inspection in 2018 contained some pellets. So this uh, trade of uh, chemicals and uh, uh, requires huge efforts to obtain some positive results on the market. Uh, although the bans are in place, sometimes you don't see the results. Uh, there was a study conducted in Germany uh, in the period 2003-2006. They controlled pellets in the urine of children and uh, 10 
years thereafter, in 2015, 2017, we could see, uh, given the fact that they took uh, adequate samples and uh, comparisons, uh, so 10 years thereafter, we could see that the quantity of phthalates uh, reduced uh, during this period of 10, 10 years, and that's what's the result of adequate measures uh, implemented in Europe. We also uh, speak about the measurements of uh, phthalates in uh, water environment, and we see that in uh, water sediments, uh, has been reduced over these 10 years. Uh, there is another trend uh, which uh, uh, indicates that they may be replacing these chemicals with other chemicals which are not uh, entirely adequate, but the, the trend is declining, the trend of uh, chemicals in us and in environment. Uh, in order to set up an adequate system, you need a lot of uh, financial systems and the way to do so is uh, to control chemicals on the market. And let's say it's uh, necessary to have sufficient funds to provide for adequate management in the field. Reagujemo sada, to će koštati mnogo više i evo od juna meseca ove godine jedna infografika Evropske agencije za hemikalije kada se uvodila... European Agency for Chemicals, when the phthalate ban was introduced, an important part in this third part says that every year by introduction of this ban, introduction of this ban saves around two thousand boys from the problems with the reproductive health. And very importantly, at the end, the benefits uh, of the funds uh, put into phasing out the use of these uh, chemicals uh, are 10 times the costs. So that's all from my side. I hope I've met your expectations, at least in terms of the time allotted to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Mart. I will take the liberty to say that you have met more than expected. You have a, a very rich experience even before you joined the Alhem, and we are very much impressed by your activities and projects as a person who comes from a civil society organization. I can say right away that Melina and I, when working in our working group, chemical safety and noise under the project uh, 2030, SF 2030 plus, we had a problem to find representatives of NGOs. You said there was the Forum Zenica Center for Environment, Vanya Luka. They have participated in this project, but they decided to join other working groups like water, waste, uh, air, etc. They uh, consider them a higher priority over the chemical safety. So we don't have in our working group uh, representatives of NGOs. And we even included in among our objectives to have the chemical safety sector meet some NGOs that are working to promote the public awareness on what we are doing. So once again, uh, this was very interesting presentation. It was very encouraging to see all of your results and i sincerely hope that we will continue our cooperation because in republika srpska and now that's what the colleagues from the federation republika srpska need to do uh, we are organizing a set of seminars to educate our advisors or consultants for chemicals so that's all from me we with this 
we have actually finished the formal part, uh, the presentation part. But I wanted to share the results of our poll once again, and I will ask our technical support to show them and to say that we have uh, actually extended the time planned for this webinar. I apologize for that, but I think that you are very, you all are of very good reasons to do so. Now we can take a look all together on these poll results and I'm inviting the panelists to to comment on this. This may be a, a problem for our colleagues from Sweden because of the language barrier. So I will read it actually. The first question, what needs to be done to make sure that uh, uh, products uh, are placed in the market that are safe or safe for use? Most of you answered to pass all the necessary uh, legislation, then 66 uh, ensure uh, inspection supervision. Most of you selected the option seven. So we recognized that the regulation, the legislation is the most important, but it's not just the leg legislation that is enough. The inspection oversight is also very important. The question number two, who is responsible for safe placement of chemicals and uh, products containing chemicals in the market in a way that is harmonized with the EU? Uh, most of you responded both equally. Uh, would any of you like to comment on this? Who is responsible for safety of products? Can we move on to the next set of questions? What do you think, whether the inspectors should have knowledge on how to properly assess the hazard, level of hazard and uh, do the classification and labeling of chemicals? 77% said yes. And uh, it requires adequate training. I think Ms. Mart uh, mentioned this in her presentation. Then uh, what do you think would be the most important thing that the uh, government bodies can offer? Uh, equal percentage here, we have a training and 34% instructions and uh, manuals. The one of the offered answers was nothing. The industry should own, uh, should provide the knowledge on their own. Are there any comments on this? Okay, then we will read the remaining questions. What do you think in how many years the new regulations will make sure that the chemicals in the market are adequately classified and marked? and uh, have adequate uh, safety data sheet. Five years, uh, 38%, 10 years, 29%. And the last question is, uh, do you think uh, that the knowledge of the regulations in the area of chemical management is necessary uh, in exporting other products to the EU countries that are not chemicals, such as the furniture, toys, uh, clothes, etc. Yes, the law on chemicals regulates the presence of chemicals in other products, 65%. I'm not sure, 22%. So these all results are very interesting. If I may add uh, one thing to the last question. We already had a comment uh, of one of the participants. This is not precise enough because it's not only the law on chemicals that regulates the presence of chemicals and uh, 
provide restrictions with respect to the furniture, clothes, uh, and uh, footwear, because there are uh, some other uh, regulations, decisions made by the Council of Ministers. This is just one addition to this offered response. So it's not only the law on chemicals at the entity level. Well, thank you, Melina. I would add to this comment that you mentioned the area of chemicals management. I think that all these uh, uh, regulations passed by the market uh, uh, supervision agency and the agency for protection of uh, plants uh, are all the regulations in the area of chemical safety, although there are some other interlinkages, but we cannot say that uh, this applies only to the law on chemicals. There are many other uh, pieces of legislation uh, applicable to many other institutions. Thank you very much for these answers. Let's try to answer some of the questions that we received from our audience, from our attendees. We have a question by Mr. Darko Kristic. In what way and how, what rule books prescribe the limits for the hazardous things, hazardous substances at a job in the context uh, of the protection at work in Sweden and Serbia? Ms. Mart has already provided the link about the Serbia, then Mr. Valjevac also offered a link uh, of regulations uh, in Republika Srpska, and she said that uh, the, these limits are regulated by the Ministry of Labor and Veteran Protection based on the law on chemicals. And here again, at the webpage of the Ministry of Health, one can find the, these rule books. Mm, perhaps uh, some of our uh, panelists from Sweden could say something about this area because uh, what we have here is the overlap between the uh, area of uh, protection at work and the chemical management. I could, uh, I could uh, say something about that. Okay. Um, <coughs> Sorry? Yes, please do, and yeah. then Mr. Portman. Uh, when you look at the areas where chemical safety is a concern, you should keep in mind that it's all about obligations. Chemicals legislation places obligations on the on industry and trade in their capacity as um, uh, manufacturers and importers placing chemicals on the market not as uh, producers, not as employers, not as transporters, but in this specific capacity of placing chemicals on the market. When you go to the workers' health and safety area, you have another set of obligations. You address industry and trade uh, in their capacity as employer, employer obligations towards the employees. And it's a quite different set than of, of um, conditions and, uh, and you, you um, are in another, under another chapter of the EU legislation. When you go to the transport of uh, uh, dangerous goods, you address industry and trade as transporters, not as employers, not as in their capacity of placing on the market, but as transporters. And when you go to um, the environmental area, environmental legislation, you address industry as the polluter and the generator of waste. It's also a different uh, set of uh, obligations and, and relations. Uh, and that is the case uh, if you look at, at the consumer protection area, chemical safety dealing with consumer protection then you have the liability of, uh, of the product, the company that is responsible for the product as such. 
uh, liability issues. So um, <clears throat> this is how it uh, was made step by step historically uh, in the 70s in many countries in Europe, you have this, you, you were concentrating very much on the workers health and safety and the later in the 70s and 80s on environmental legislation. And it became this way. Chemicals legislation, when it uh, was established in the 90s and later, is complementary when it places the obligations the way it does. So um, um, you can say that chemicals legislation is about the responsibility for chemicals as such, how they look, and what properties and effects they, they have when they are let into society by the, the companies that import and manufacture them and place them on the market. Um, if you go to the workers' health and safety area, you can also see that the very concept of chemicals becomes so different because there also you have, let's say the, the melting, uh, burning iron, you have the hot water vapor, you have the dust from wood that could uh, explode or implode, etc. You have chemical agents at work that are not considered hazardous chemicals when they are placed on the market. Uh, so you, you must see the differences here, that you are in different worlds, uh, different uh, areas, really. And that's also why it's in the workers' health and safety area. You have the limits for exposure of workers because it's, a, it's an obligation of the employer to uh, uh, ensure that uh, you do not supersede those limits. Uh, can I add just uh, so specifically for the, there are occupational exposure limits on the EU level but they are in the main uh, indicative. So it's up to each uh, member state to set their own. There are a few binding occupational exposure limits, but most of them are indicative. So uh, it's uh, in each member state, uh, you make your own decisions on the occupational exposure limits. Uh, like in Sweden, they are binding. Uh, in other countries, they are not binding. They are more um, indicative. Um, but always in the, under the chemical legislation, under REACH, you have to make a risk assessment to see if, um, if the, it's a safe level uh, in a typical exposure scenario. So I hope that helps. I can find, I don't have uh, the links to uh, the, the websites that explain this uh, occupational exposure limits, but I'm sure I can find it if, it's, uh, if you want. Thank you. Thank you for these responses. We will continue with our questions. Here we have several uh, commandments uh, for uh, our uh, panelists. Very good, kind words. And we have a, a one question. I believe. It uh, is about the results uh, of the public opinion survey. Uh, the question concerns the size of the sample. Okay, I will answer this. This uh, survey was done uh, on with the 1009 interviewees. Uh, this is considered the strategic, the, uh, the standard sample. The technique used was omnibus, and uh, it covered uh, representatives, age, uh, rural, urban, gender, uh, balance, etc. So this is the sample that is considered the standard in this type of omnibus uh, survey. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rangelovic, then Ms. Mina Pajevic, she is in the sector of the chemicals uh, of the Ministry of Health and Social Protection. She wants to thank the uh, presenters 
for very important information as well as to for support mr lind provided support to the institutions of bosnia herzegovina when passing the new chemical legislation and the employees uh, in the ministry of health and social protection of republika srpska participated in their training these are excellent courses that they want to recommend to all colleagues involved in uh, chemical management Ms. pajevic also wants to greet uh, colleagues from the alhem i am familiar with their work and uh, they can offer some very important data they can be used for chemical management and raising awareness among general population we hope that similar activities uh, will be done in bosnia herzegovina i also hope that uh, some of the cso's in bosnia will recognize the importance of safe um, management of chemicals and maybe work with alhem or other organizations in the region implement these experiences I, as i said uh, i also hope that we will find some uh, NGOs who will take a more active part in this. And Ms. Pajovic also added a link to the EU legislation on hazardous uh, substances. And um, Zorica, it's interesting how they work with the civil sector. It concerns Alhem. Andrea, good day. I want to greet everybody and thank you for this uh, great uh, webinar. My name is Andrea Muharemovic and I work on the environmentally friendly management of uh, substances in the sector of solid waste financed by Sweden. I wish to exchange contact data with all the participants in order to discuss the possible future cooperation well thank you this is excellent we've just done that emina kadric asks uh, have you done the uh, testing of the materials used for packaging like pt aluminum glass uh, and other packaging materials that are used for packaging products uh, would anybody want to answer this question have you ever done the testing of materials used as uh, packaging materials like pt miss rangelovic want to answer yes i can comment uh, more sp specifically we did not engage in this uh, thoroughly but there is uh, a set of regulation that is uh, being uh, adopted at the EU level. The right, and that pertains to the right of the consumer to know about the presence of uh, SVHC in terms of uh, food, it pertains to the packaging. So this application that we have been promoting and that I explained, those who place food, solid food or beverage on the market, they are obliged to respond to the request of uh, consumers to know about the presence of these substances in packages. And uh, so it, it doesn't pertain to the pro uh, product as such, just to the packaging. And as for the packaging, we tested packaging uh, of certain polystyrene uh, uh, plastic packaging. Uh, we cannot uh, say that it was a representative example sample, and uh, we used uh, some 10 samples. The, packaging was uh, mostly paper or plastic uh, packaging and we tested the presence uh, of uh, polybrom uh, uh, 
substances there and uh, we identify very low content of these substances. but I, I i cannot uh, say with certainty because we had a very few samples taken and we are now uh the eu to regulate these food food contact uh, provisions and then we will see what is the situation in our market thank you very much for this uh, answer mr folkman did yes, you can, want to say something yeah I, I can just add that uh, food contact materials is uh, separate legislation um, because they have requirements not only on content but they also do simulation with uh, oil and um, alcohol and water to see how much is does actually leak out from from the substance uh, from the material to typical food uh, so it's not our agency here in Sweden it's an, uh, it's the food safety authority that makes that but there is legislation very specific with specific uh, requirements as well on substances that cannot be used for food packaging uh, so it's more strict than uh, just uh, chemicals, articles in the chemicals legislation. Thank you. And with this answer, we exhausted all the questions received from our participants. I'm very happy we did so. And may I use the opportunity now to ask uh, our colleagues from Sweden about the way of uh, operation and the, of, of the help desk for chemical safety. Uh, is it uh, within the agency for chemicals or elsewhere. Perhaps Mr. Lind. Yes, uh, well, uh, member states um, have to provide official help desks according to the REACH regulation. It's very much about the uh, REACH registration and uh, but also about safety data sheets. And when it comes to the CLP regulation, the classification and labeling requirements, and the biocidal product uh, regulation. Uh, so those in those three cases, you are uh, you have to set up a help desk as a member state. And preparing for membership, um, you are supposed to have help desks as well. The, the, that kind of help desks. Uh, it could be um, uh, coordinated. The, could be one help desk for the three regulations. It uh, depends also on how how you are organized in, in, in your country. Uh, if the chemicals legislation um, uh, institutional setup is in the area of, of the uh, environment, as in Serbia, then um, the help desk regarding bicycle products uh, um, well, it, it, it would be um, set up by the Minister of Health. Uh, and you can, uh, I, I, Valentina <laughs> can explain how it was, was uh, done, I don't know. But um, in, uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, as you have chemicals legislation in the health sector, you could have a combined help desk for the three regulations. Uh, those are official help desks. They, are, they uh, should not give a consultancy service to industry. They should help industry to navigate in the legislation, to find where uh, their obligations are and where the more precise requirements are. Uh, they should not interpret the, the legislation. It's up to the companies to understand it, but they, they should... Um, um, help to find a way in the jungle, so to say. Um, often help desks are placed with uh, competent authorities, but it, it isn't said that they have to be there. Uh, originally in some EU countries, the help desks were in a completely different place. They were uh, in Italy, for example, um, set up with a, a European Union information office. Uh, also in some other countries. But the tendency, the very strong trend is that 
it, it's placed on the competent authorities because it's a, a good way of using the competence and capacity. I think, and it's it's also a very good way for the staffers, so the staff at the competent authority, to have a everyday uh, contact with the companies with, with, uh, that have the obligations with the with, with the importers and the manufacturers. So um, that's what I could say on that theme. If it's uh, to be more specific, the question. Yeah. yeah, but in Sweden, in Sweden, it's in the Swedish Chemicals Agency. So it started to be with, uh, you know, just all the staff who had some knowledge went around and was sometimes in the help desk. But then it, uh, it developed, so it, now it's established a unit that only does help desk function and also information material, seminars, etc. And they are the first line, if you like. They can go to the experts. Uh, if needed, but it's much more effective to have uh, dedicated staff answering because they often get the same question many times and then they can write an answer and put it on the web page rather than everybody has to write the same answer in an email uh, again and again. So, um, so that's the way it's developed in Sweden, at least, um, for the help desk. Most member states have uh, smaller competent authorities than Sweden, and then they organize the help desk as, as an expert tree. tree. So uh, there are a couple of persons responsible for taking the phone calls and answering the emails, but they have uh, like branches of people in the network that can help them and they can uh, forward questions to uh, experts uh, uh, inside the ministry or uh, at other ministries. So you can organize uh, that kind of um, backup for the help desk. Yeah. Thank you very much for your answers. Any further questions for our panelists? If there are no further questions, uh, we already exceeded uh, the time allotted to this webinar, then we can close the webinar. May I once again thank all the speakers, panelists, uh, participants. At some point, we had uh, 150 participants. Uh, I thank the tech technical support and our local partner for excellent technical arrangements for this webinar. Although the situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, uh, is diverse in different territories in terms of chemical safety, I do hope that uh, we successfully obtained answers which will be relevant for all these uh, levels of administration, but could this federation and the Publica Srpska, and that they will be able to use this information to jointly work on further progress. That would be all from my side. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope uh, we will meet again in the near future. Thank you. Thank you.